Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, we're good to resume uh, after just some technical issues with the setup. If you can ask the brothers at the back to move a bit forward, inshallah. And without further delay, uh, our Ustad, Ustad Hisham Abu Yusuf, about the topic of practical tips or practical tools for tadabbur. Bismillah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. I'm very happy to see a you know young and charged audience today and especially after Sheikh Abu Taymiyyah inshallah you should all be awake and and kicking and not physically kicking of course only metaphorically. Um, this is going to be an uh, interactive workshop so I expect your participation as much as my participation. Um, so you know. I'll be asking you to put your hands up, to share your thoughts, share your ideas, your reflections, etc. So, without any further ado, we're going to start with a question to all of you. How do you think the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions, how did they learn the Qur'an? And how did they study the Qur'an? See some hands. Bismillah, go ahead. Okay, when an ayah was revealed, he says they would recite it all the time. Not quite. Yes. Okay, he's saying each companion would learn a different verse and a different surah. Not quite. Yes. Beautiful. So there's one point uh, Uncle's mentioning that it was, uh, it was from teacher to student. There's a kind of chain, which is true. Correct. But there's more I want. Yes. Perfect. So you're saying they would learn 10 ayahs at a time. Anybody want to give me more detail? What would they do with those 10 ayahs? Would they recite them, memorize them? Yes. Okay. They'd act upon those ayahs. Yes. Okay, beautiful. The Prophet ﷺ would re repeat the ayah and they would repeat it after him. So from what all of you have said, you've all come close to the essence I'm trying to get to. Abu Abdul Rahman al-Sulami radiallahu anhu narrates in Musnad al-Imam Ahmad, he says, القرآن, Those who used to teach us Quran from the Prophet's companions, the senior companions of the Prophet, like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Uthman ibn Affan. How did the how was the Prophet وسلم, Quran school? How did it run? What was how was it organized? They would not pass by ten verses. So they would teach ten verses at a time. And every ten verses they would teach, the Prophet وسلم, would teach. The ilm, the knowledge associated with those 10 verses And the amal, the actions associated with those 10 verses Then they would move on to the next 10 verses This is how the Prophet's companions would teach This is how their madrasa ran So it wasn't built on pure memorization with no meaning It wasn't based or built on pure recitation with no reflection It was slow pace, 10 verses at a time And the Quran has thousands of verses So they were not in a rush to complete but every 10 verses, they would learn what it meant and what they had to do about it, and then they would move to the next 10. Amar, you had your hand up, sorry. Do you have anything to add to that? Beautiful, mashallah. Gentlemen, those who are older, please. Be inspired. Yes, they would learn the action. They would not just learn the words, they would learn the action. How to live the Quran. Really, this was what the Prophet Wasallam's Quran learning method was about. How can we live the Quran? It wasn't about just recitation, just memorization. They were a means to an end. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun liyaddabbaru ayatih. This is a blessed book, a Mubarak revelation. We have sent it down for what purpose? For you to reflect and think about its signs. And people of sound intellect can actually think about what's inside this revelation. So the purpose of the Quran, the reason Allah sent it down was not purely for its recitation. The ultimate purpose of the Qur'an is that we think about its meanings. 
We're going to investigate this word tadabbur shortly and what exactly it means. Elsewhere in the Quran, Allah asks the question. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Why don't they reflect on the Qur'an? أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Or are their hearts locked up? This verse gives us the consequence. What's the... If we don't reflect on the Qur'an, if we don't know what it means, what's the consequence of that? It means your heart and my heart is locked up from the guidance of Allah. Can you imagine? That one of us might recite or might memorize the Qur'an, but that recitation and that memorization has no effect on our actions. We've never thought about what it means. It's had no effect on our real life. That means our heart is locked up from Allah's guidance. May Allah protect all of us. And how many a person we know, you might know, a person who's memorized the entire Qur'an, but they don't act on a single word that is within it. And how many of us does that reflect on our lives as well? So the purpose of the Qur'an that it was sent down is for our minds to be occupied with reflecting, thinking deeply about what it means and then living the Qur'an. When Aisha radiallahu anha describes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa she says, كَانَ خُلُقُهُ Quran. His life, his actions, he was like a walking Qur'an. And so, when it comes down to it, there are three levels of engagement with the Qur'an. Yeah? The very base level, the very bottom of the pyramid, is what we call a tartil to recite the Qur'an beautifully. Many of us, that's all we know. We don't know anything more than recitation. But that is only the first level. Allah says in the Qur'an, وَرَتِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا Recite the Qur'an with a beautiful melody. That's just level one, my friends. That is not the, that's not the, the destination. That's just the first step. The second step is to know its meanings and to think about those meanings. Imagine, imagine a day you wake up in the morning and the whole day you're thinking about قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ from different angles, you're asking questions, you're thinking about how you can act on those verses. That's a day where you've really, you've engulfed your mind in thinking about the Qur'an. But then it's still not complete. The journey is not complete. You did not reach the destination. You are not a person of the Qur'an yet. There is one final step. It is action. You have to act on the Qur'an. The Qur'an demands us to change. The Qur'an demands us to move. The Qur'an demands us to act. The Sahaba were practical people. The Qur'an was not just something they'd listen to in the car on their commute. It changed their life completely. Imagine Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Right. Anybody know a funny story about Umar ibn al-Khattab before Islam? A story that he himself used to laugh. He used to laugh at himself over this story. Yes. He went on a journey. Right? He was, went on his journey and he realized that his idol, he had left his idol at home. So he took a bunch of dates, he molded it into the idol. And then later he got hungry. So he ate, <laughs> he ate it. <laughs> and he laughs at himself. So this man who was doing such, you know, such an action which you and me and he is laughing at. There comes a time 20 years later where he is the emperor or the khalifa of uh, an empire stretching from east to west. From someone doing such an unintelligent thing to someone who is the master of a, such a large khilafah, such a large caliphate from east to west. What changed Umar? Was there something in his tea? Something in the lamb? Something in his food? Did he start eating different kinds of diet? Was it the, you know, he moved location so the weather was different, the air cut, something was in the air? What changed Umar? Yes. It was the Qur'an. The thing that transforms people is the Qur'an. And it transformed this group of Arabs from tri people who are you know, fighting with each other, tribes killing each other, burying their daughters alive. They, it transformed them into the masters of civilization. You and me, the reason we recite the Qur'an and it does nothing to you and me is because we are satisfied with just recitation. We have no interest in the Qur'an changing our lives or impacting our actions. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, the Prophet's companion, he said, for me to recite a small surah, a small chapter of the Quran, like, إِذَا زُلْزِلَةِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَةِ Surah Zalzala, 
or Al-Qari'ah, one of the shortest chapters of the Quran. For me to recite a small surah while thinking about its meanings and really going deep in its meanings is better for me than reciting all of Baqarah and Ali Imran, a hundred pages, without thinking about their meanings. For you and me, the criteria is the opposite. We would rather get through the pages quicker than stop and think. We are obsessed with quantity. They were obsessed with, with quality. So, second question to all of you. Can anybody reflect on the Qur'an or does it require some qualifications? Some subject matter expertise, some special prerequisite knowledge. Or can anybody just pick up the Qur'an and share what they think about the Qur'an's meanings? That's a question for all of you. You can put your hands up, you can share your ideas. Yes, Ahsan. He's saying anyone can reflect, you don't need a qualification to reflect. Yes. Okay, you need to understand what it's saying at least. Yes. Okay, before you reflect, you need to know the meaning and the context. Yes. Okay, it's not necessary, but to truly unlock the Quran, you need the Arabic language. Yes? Okay, you need to read it with an open heart. Beautiful. Yes? You have to? Okay, he's saying anybody can reflect on it, but for it to really change your life, you need to have taqwa. Yes, brother. Okay, so, so you're saying you need to refer to the tafsir books, the, the, what the scholars have said about the meanings of the Qur'an. Can anybody do tafsir? No? Yes? Okay, so you're saying you need, to pr you need to feel as though the Qur'an is speaking to you. We'll take one more. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're saying understanding the Qur'an is of levels, but if you, want to, you need to be a person of understanding if you want to go deeper. I will summarize, inshallah, in this table. There are two terms you need to understand. There's a difference between, there's two different terms. There's something called tafsir, which is explaining what does the Qur'an mean. And there's something called tadabbur, which is reflecting on those meanings. Okay. Tafsir is something that can only be done by scholars, by qualified and very knowledgeable scholars. Tafsir in Arabic, fassara yufassiru, is to convey a meaning, to, to explain what does something mean. Tadabbur is to take that meaning and to then think about it and apply it to your life. But you cannot tell me what the Quran means. Because the Arabic language is deep. Every word has 10, 15 different possible meanings, connotations. If anybody, you and me, could just say, yeah, the Qur'an means this and the Qur'an means that, then we'd be in a big trouble right now. <laughs> However, once the meaning has been given to you, the correct meaning has been arrived at, and an interpretation has been given to you, you can then think about that meaning and think about how to apply it to your life. You can make connections between meanings. But uncovering the meaning itself has to be done by the scholars. This is where tafsir comes in and the difference between tafsir and tadabbur. So who can do tafsir? The scholars. Who can do tadabbur? Who can reflect on the Quran? Anybody. It's open to all. How is tafsir done? Tafsir has a process. It has a framework. You have to look at the Arabic language. You have to look at other verses of the Quran. You have to look at the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ. You have to look at what the salaf, the earliest Muslim, said about these verses. It has a process and a framework before you can say the ayah means X. Tadabbur 
there's no limited material. That you can have as many reflections as people on this planet. And somebody in the 21st century can have a reflection that somebody 10 centuries ago could not reach to. You know. So tadabbur in Arabic comes from the, the, the Arabic letters dal ba ra, which means to get to behind something, to make an effort to get behind something. You know, you want to know what's below the surface. You want to dig deeper. You want to dive to find the pearls in the Quran. This is what tadabbur is about: is to get beyond the surface, beyond the apparent meaning of the Quran. So it's a two-stage process, right? Think of it like, uh, let's say you are making, this is a, a very bad analogy, but it's just come to my mind right now. Let's say you're hungry for lunch and you don't know what to do. You don't have the money to go and eat out. So what do you do? You go to the supermarket, you pick up a frozen pizza and you put the pizza in the oven. But before you put it in the oven, you add some toppings of your own, some olives, some pieces of chicken, some special sauces. And you put it in the oven. The pizza, the base of the pizza came already made, right? Because you and me, we don't know how to make dough. We don't know how to bake bread. We don't know how to do the whole thing. But we can add the toppings. Similarly, all the hard work to tell you what does this verse mean is done by the scholars of tafsir. And then you and me, we have to think about how do these verses connect? How do these verses apply to me? And we have to think about those verses. And inshallah, in today's session, we're going to give you three practical tools to engage and to really reflect on the Qur'an. Okay, before we jump into that, question for all of you. Why do we struggle to reflect on the Qur'an's meanings? For some people, it's a mental block. When you tell them, look at the meanings of the Qur'an and think about them, they don't know where to start, they're stuck. But why do we struggle to do this? When was the last time we did this? And what has stopped us from engaging with the Qur'an at a deeper level, more than just recitation? Yes. Okay, our sins can sometimes be an obstacle for us. What else? Yes. Sincerity, a lack of sincerity. Yes. Maybe you just didn't know the process. I think that would be most of us. You know, maybe many of us are sincere. You know, many of us, you know, we want to know what the Quran, but we don't know where to start. What else? Yes. Some of us, we have a hard heart. Even if all of the tafsir was given to us in the world, it would not penetrate. Yes. Uh, we're not willing to make the time. It's a good point. Yes. Allah. Yeah, every time, why, why do this to me? Why you make me emotional every time with your beautiful answers? MashaAllah. <laughs> a sealed heart. May Allah protect all of us. Allah says in the Quran, أَفَمَنْ شَرَحَ اللَّهُ صَدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ فَهُوَ عَلَى نُورٍ مِّنْ رَبِّهِ As for the one Allah has opened their heart to Islam, it is like they are upon a light from Allah. فَوَيْلٌ لِلْقَاسِيَةٍ قُلُوبُهُمْ مِّنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ How horrible is the situation of people's hearts. Who, their hearts are too hard to remember Allah. That can be many of us. That we are too spiritually dead to benefit from the Quran. That can, be, that can be the case for many of us. We can have all the material, all the information, the books, the resources, the, the clips, but nothing goes through. May Allah protect all of us. Okay. Before we get into the tools, the practical tools, you need to first set the scene. You need to set the environment. When you go to a restaurant, we don't just go there for the food. You could have ordered takeout. We go there for the ambience, for the lighting, for the seating, for the dishes, for the service. You need to set the scene before you can really benefit from the Quran. And there's a few tips here. The first thing, you need to prepare the heart. If this heart is a rock hard heart, then you need to soften it. And there's nothing that can soften the heart like seeking the forgiveness of Allah, al istighfar. And seeking the, and repentance, asking Allah's sincere repentance. The second thing is to really recite the Qur'an with a melodious recitation. There's a reason why the Qur'an did not reveal as a book that dropped out of the sky. It was a recitation. The word Qur'an in Arabic literally means a recital, something that is recited. And the recitation of the Qur'an can unlock the heart by itself. So try to recite the Qur'an beautifully as best as you can. Number three, 
engage with the Quran. Don't be in a rush. Why are you in a rush? When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would recite the Quran, especially in the night prayer, if he passed by a verse about the hellfire, what would he do? He would stop and he would seek refuge in the hellfire. Imagine you are reading the Quran and you read, Inna ashab al yawma fi shughulin The people of paradise are so occupied with enjoyment. And you stop and you imagine that moment and you say, Oh Allah, make me from the people of paradise. Say Amen. Amen. And then you move on to the next verse. See, you, you tasted the verse, you rolled it around your mouth, you let the flavor sink, and then you moved on to the next verse. Right? Engage. What's the rush? The second thing is repetition. The Prophet ﷺ, if he was reciting the Quran and he came across an ayah that hit him, he would stop and he would repeat the ayah again and again and again. There was a time in which the Prophet ﷺ prayed the entire night reciting one verse of the Quran. In tu'adhibuhum fa innahum ibaduk. Oh Allah, if you punish my ummah, my people, then they are your slaves. You can do as you wish. Wa in taghfir lahum fa innaka anta al-'azizul hakim. But oh Allah, if you forgive them, you are the mighty and the wise. Oh Allah, forgive my ummah. This verse, when he recited it, it made him cry. And he recited it again and again and again and again and again and again until Fajr. Try doing it this Ramadan. Choose a verse of the Quran that hits you and repeat it in Salah 50 times. Stop. Don't rush to the next one. Pause. Enjoy it. Taste the sweetness of this verse of the Quran. Number four is writing your reflections. You know, having a journal or a book, a notebook that you buy and you write on top, this is my Quran reflections journal. And everywhere you go, you're in the metro, you're in a taxi, you're on a long train journey, you're sitting in the hospital waiting for your appointment and you put your earphones and listen to some Quran, you read the meanings and you start writing your reflections. And 20 years later, you look back at your reflections. What a beautiful journey. What a beautiful documentation of your journey with the Quran. Right? So write to write and share your reflections. And also to memorize. Now I just told you one of the best ways to taste the Quran's meanings is to repeat the verse again and again. That's what memorization is. Memorization is to repeat the verse again and again. So when you memorize the Quran, see it as a means to an end. Learn the meanings of the verse, then memorize it. And you will taste it, you will enjoy it. You will, it will impact you and transform your life. Number five, share, and share with your friends and family. Don't just keep the study of the Quran and the reflection of the Quran to yourself. Make it a communal thing. Start a WhatsApp group. Start a circle. We're all going to reflect on Surah Yasin this month, on Surah Al-Fatiha this month. Make it a group thing because together you will be stronger. Alone you will lose consistency, you will lose motivation, you will drop out of the race. But together you are stronger. This is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the famous hadith when he says, مَجْتَمَعَ قَوْمٌ فِي بَيْتٍ مِنْ بُيُوتِ اللَّهِ Anytime a group of people, قَوْمٌ gather in a house of Allah, يَتْلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ They recite the book of Allah, وَيَتَدَارَسُونَهُ فِي مَا بَيْنَهُمْ They study its meanings together. It's not just about coming together in the masjid and reciting the Quran. It's about reflecting together, sharing your reflections together. And the Prophet ﷺ promises that the mercy of Allah will descend and the angels will descend and you will feel peace of mind and peace of heart. This is called, you know, when people are trying to quit like uh, alcohol or gambling, they have these circles, Alcoholics Anonymous, Tobacco Anonymous. You come there, you say, you confess my struggles, this is what I've reached. Start, uh, start a, a group for Quranic Anonymous, Quranic Reflections Anonymous, you know? Bring a group of people who don't know each other and let all of you reflect on Wal-Asr inna al-insana lafi khusr and share your reflections about time, about the passage of time, about the loss of not making use of your time, about the people of Iman. Talk about it, share. And you will find that gathering, you, you know, a lot of us, you know, we're just around the corner from one of the most popular, you know, roads in the country in terms of food, right? Muslims, when we want recreation, we want to enjoy ourselves, we go for food. We tell ourselves there's not many other halal things to do, so we might as well just go and eat. And you sit there, you eat, you banter with your mates, two hours, three hours, four hours. 
you come home and you feel emptiness in your heart. You don't feel fulfilled. Something was missing from the gathering. But I'm telling you something. Try it once. 45 minutes, half an hour of a gathering where you are discussing the Quran will fill you up so much for weeks you'll go by without needing any socializing. Because it's a wholesome social. You're socializing around the Quran. So revive this concept of reflecting on the Quran together as groups, as brothers, as sisters, etc. Okay. Before we, there's three tools I'm going to share with you today. But before the three tools, there's a skill you need to learn. Half of reflecting on the Quran, 50% of the skill and the art and the science of tadabbur is about asking questions of the Quran. There's a few example questions here on the slide. Why did Allah say it this way? What is the link between this verse and the previous verse? Why did Allah give that example and that analogy? How is the oath that Allah took linked to the statement after the oath? How can I apply this in my life? You know, where do I fall short? The more questions you ask, the more you'll be able to reflect. And if you don't know how to ask a question, you will not be able to reflect on the Quran. Are you ready for a practical exercise? Okay, bismillah. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ Those who spend money when times are easy and when times are difficult. وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْضَ وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ Those that swallow their anger and are forgiving to people. وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Allah loves the people of Ihsan, people of excellence. I want you to look at this verse. I want you to tell me what questions would you ask? Don't say, share any reflections. What questions would you ask of this verse? I'll give you guys one minute. And while those, put, put your hand up if you have a question so we can keep going. Yes. Go on. What was the context of this verse? What were the verses before and after? What else? Yes. What is the link between spending money and anger? Beautiful. What else? What does muhsin mean? Being the, the doers of good, the, those who are of people of excellence. What does it mean if you're poor and you can't spend? What else? I just want you to ask questions. Yes, Naim. Beautiful. Why is it in that order? Why is it spending first, restraining anger second, and forgiving people last? Why is it the order not different? Yes. Beautiful. How do you define ease and hardship? Yes. What does Ihsan, being somebody of excellence, of closeness to Allah, what does that have to do with spending, forgiving, and controlling your anger? Yes. How come Salah is not mentioned here? Good. Do you guys get it? You starting to get it? You have to ask questions like the ones we've just asked. Otherwise, the Quran, otherwise you'll never get deeper than the surface level of the Quran. Okay, we're just asking questions. Any more? One more last question before we go on? Yes. Does spending only refer to time? Or money? Beautiful. Does spending, al-infaq, just refer to money or does it also mean time? Or sweat or blood or tears? All of you, mashallah, these questions can be turned into reflections. Yes? So you can reflect and you can think that spending, sacrificing for the sake of Allah is more than just money. You can reflect that a poor person, even if they spend one penny, but if that's hard for them and they did it for the sake of Allah, that might bring them to the state of ihsan. You might reflect on how important people interactions are to reach closeness to Allah, forgiving of people and controlling anger. And there's no mention of salah and zakah, even though those are the, ruk, the arkan, the pillars of Islam. So these questions turn into reflections. Second verse. Okay, this one is an interesting one. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhan nasu duriba mathalun fastami'u lah. O people, all people, here is an example, an illustration, so listen carefully. 
ان الذين تد ان الذين تدعون من دون الله لن يخلقوا ذبابا ولو اجتمعوا له those who you call on beside allah they cannot create a fly even if they all came together to do so and if a fly took something away from them they would never be able to retrieve it ضعف الطالب والمطلوب the person making dua is weak and the one they're making dua to is they're both weak what questions would you ask of this ayah don't give me answers what questions would you ask of this ayah yes why is allah talking about a fly beautiful why not a camel okay what other questions would we ask beautiful you know when someone asks a question then you start thinking about the answer that becomes a reflection yes Why doesn't Allah just talk to the believers? Why all people? Why ya ayuhan nas? Yes, Naim. When Allah gives an example, he usually just starts the example. Mm. For example, he says all three words. Mm. Then he says, Yes, Allah, you can do this. Yes. Then he says, Yes, Allah, you can do this. 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 Yes, Allah, Listen carefully to this example. Why does he do that? Good. What else? What other questions can we ask? Allahu Akbar. Why does Allah show us their weakness rather than showing us his strength? Yes. Why did Allah mention the fly taking something away and not just the creation of the fly? And you know what questions beget more questions. When you hear people's questions you start getting ideas as well. It opens doors for you to think about the Quran in a way you never thought before. So when you do create your WhatsApp group and your Tadabbur anonymous group, make sure you start the session with questions. And then you can discuss the answers later. Someone has hands up? No. خلاص. Okay. Yes. What is the limit to the questions? Good. The limit is when you're asking a question your it's based on an assumed meaning because the translation is actually a tafsir it's an interpretation of the verse so based on the meaning of this verse you are asking the question now what you shouldn't do is you shouldn't do tafsir you shouldn't twist the meanings or create new meanings the the fly symbolizes the end of times hold on a second <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> the fly represents russia and ukraine whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> hold our horses here my friend yes so there are some i'm going to give you some guidelines at the end how do you know if your reflection is valid or you've gone into the you've crossed the limit basically this is not gcse literature you can't put words in the author's mouth the author was intending this and that no you got to there's a limit there's a there's a boundary Yeah but we'll, I just want you to be comfortable asking questions and then I'll give you the boundaries at the end inshallah okay so the first tool to reflect on the Quran is getting an overview of the surah this picture you see on the side I don't know if you can all see it clearly but if I'm not mistaken this is a picture of a city in Argentina when you are in the city you are on the ground right you just see all these houses and the structure doesn't make sense but as you zoom out and you go up in an aeroplane from birds eye view you can see the city is organized in a certain way similarly the quran is similar when you are reciting a surah verse to verse it may seem like the surah has no structure it might seem chaotic like a maze but if you zoom out for a second and you try to get a big picture view it will all make sense the way the topics and themes move will make sense so let's pick a surah for example you know let's say i don't know سورة الزلزال إذا زلزلت الأرض زلزالا. First, before you reflect carefully on the surah, do a quick skim read. What are the main subjects that the surah talks about? One, two, three. Yeah. Okay, talks about the world ending. Then. Yeah. All the how all the secrets will come out, the consequences, etc. So. Number two, once you've got that big picture of the surah, let's say surah Yasin, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six things it talks about in this order. The second thing you need to think about: why is some themes more emphasized than other? 
Why did Allah spend 80 ayahs talking about this subject, but that subject he just talked about it for two ayahs? That will start for you to realize what is this surah really about? And lastly, you think about how are these themes connected? What's the link between them? What does this have to do with this? Because you can think about, the, you know, the word surah in Arabic, sur in Arabic means refers to a fence, you know, or a, a big gate around a city. You can think of a surah like a city. Every city has its unique features, its own languages, its own attractions, pe things people do. But if you, take, if you buy a ticket today to go to Algeria or Morocco and you land there, you'll feel lost. You won't have a clue what you're supposed to do. Before you go, you get an idea. I'm going to Fez. The people speak this. These are the main masajid to visit. These are the main museums. Okay, I have a plan now. Then when you reach there, you don't feel lost. This is the first tool. Before you jump into studying a surah, try to get a big picture of the surah. What are its main themes? How are they connected? And why does Allah talk? Start to think about it from a big picture. Maqasid al-Suwar, it's called in Arabic, right? Or tafsir al mawdu'i So you think about the big picture. Don't worry about individual verses. What is the big picture of the surah about? This is the first tool. The second part of that first tool is to know, for you to try and find out, is this surah Makkan or Madinan? And this information you will find in the tafsir books. And some translations of the Quran as well such as Muhammad Abdul Halim's translation, such as the Qur'an Project. There's a black uh, book called The Qur'an Project. It's a translation of the Qur'an, but it will also have some of these details about the surah, the main themes of the surah, where was it revealed. Part of this first tool, knowing the background of a surah, is knowing whether the surah, was it revealed before the hijrah, before the migration of the Prophet or after. The reason is because revelation before and after hijrah is very different. You know, the last few short chapters of the Qur'an, who can tell me, where were they revealed? Yes. Mecca, Meccan or Medinan? No. Meccan. Surahs revealed in Mecca before the Prophet's migration, they tend to be shorter, they tend to rhyme more, they tend to focus on Tawheed, on the Day of Judgment, on the Prophethood. So they have specific subjects, specific style, and because it's talking, which audience, when the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca, who was his main audience? Sorry? Non-Muslims, correct. The main, the main audience in early Mecca was non-Muslims and? Sorry? Yeah, idol worshippers comes under non-Muslims. Who else? People, not in Mecca, there were not many people of the book in Mecca. Not, there was not many Jews and Christians in Mecca, yes. New Muslims. So Quran revealed in Mecca is primarily talking to non-Muslims and new Muslims. And so the verses are shorter, they're more concise, they're more rhyming, they have different themes, different audience. Quran that was revealed after the Hijrah in Medina, now the Muslims have a government, they have a state, they have an army, they have enemies. So now verses are not just talking about Allah and the Day of Judgment, it's also talking about laws, inheritance, divorce, war. Right? Surrender. And who else is in Medina that wasn't in Mecca? Jews and Christians. Medina has a big, a large population of Jews. So the Quran is now suddenly talking not just to disbelievers and new Muslims, it's talking to Ahlul Kitab. Ya Ahlul Kitab, la taghlu fi dinkum. Ya Ahlul Kitab, ta'alu. Ya Ahlul Kitab. It's talking to Jews and Christians. So the style and the theme. And the audience differs depending on where the surah was revealed. Just like, you know, mashallah, because we're in Mashal Furqan, I can give this example. It's like if you ask somebody whether they're from Somalia or Somaliland, <laughs> yes, different styles, different places, different foods, different cultures, yes, or India or Pakistan, you know, some people think we're all the same. Tell that to one of us, <laughs> they won't be very happy, right? So knowing the surah before you jump in is important. Right? Just like because you're all young men, before you all go looking for your, inshallah, future wife or second wife, yes, first thing you try to find out is the ethnicity, you know? Are you Arab? Are you African? Are you Asian? Are you, where are you from? Because when you know the ethnicity, you start to know some things about them, right? You want some information before the first meeting. You want the bio, right? The age, the hobbies, all of this stuff. Similarly, before you jump into the surah, Yes, I'm just giving examples for you guys. 
You should know some background knowledge about the surah. What are its subjects? What are its themes? Where was it revealed? Now you know the audience, the style, the subject matter, the focus of the surah. As an example, Surah Al-Baqarah, approximately 50 odd pages, longest surah on the Quran. When you break down its themes, it actually has a structure that makes sense. And you find actually most surahs of the Quran, I can't say every surah of the Quran, most surahs of the Quran have a circular structure. What do I mean by circular structure? Symmetrical structure, what does that mean? First, the first passage of Baqarah talks about iman and kufr, belief and unbelief. Right? ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا So Allah talks about iman and kufr in the first part of Baqarah. In the last part of Baqarah, what does Allah talk about? Who, who remembers the first verse in the last passage? Famously. آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ بِمَا كُلٌّ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَةِ يُكْتُبِهِ So the first part of Baqarah talks about iman, belief, and the last part of Baqarah talks about iman. The second subject in Baqarah is about Allah creating Adam and Eve and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge of everything. The second last subject of Baqarah is the same. The third subject of Baqarah and the third last is the same. The fourth subject and the fourth last is the same. The, the surah is like a mirror in the middle. The start is like the end and the second is like the second last and the third is like the third last. So you see the surah has a circular structure. Right? And many scholars of the past, Asyuti, Nidham al-Quran and others, uh, Imam al-Farahi uh, from the subcontinent and others, they identified the Quran, many people think it has no structure. It's just a mess. billah. But when you start breaking down the subjects, you realize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a certain structure in the way in every surah. And I have another example for surah Yusuf, but I won't come to that. So this is the first tool is knowing the surah before you jump into the surah. Knowing the city before you visit the city, knowing the girl before you propose. Okay. Tool number two is knowing the context of the verses you are reflecting on. Okay. I'll give an example. There are some verses in the Quran you will not understand them until you know why they were revealed in which situation they were revealed. We know the Quran didn't just drop from the sky. It was revealed in bits and pieces over the course of 24 years, 23 years, sorry. So Allah would reveal a certain verse at the right time and the right place. When you understand why and where he revealed this verse, it starts to make sense for you. I'll give you an example. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuha nabiyyu lima tuharrimu ma ahallallahu lak. O Prophet, why do you make haram, prohibited something Allah made halal for you? If one of us made something halal into haram, that's a big problem. So what is this verse talking about? Did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi You might think by reading the translation that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was playing with the laws of Allah. No, he wasn't. Who knows where? Why was this verse revealed? In what context? In what situation? Yes. Um, the, the verse that you mentioned was revealed in Mm -hmm. gave uh -huh. so, he stood, so he stayed longer than expected. Yep. So after that, he went to a different. Uh, so after that, uh, the others, mm -hmm. the other, the others uh, were not happy. So after that, when when he, when when he came into the other people's house, uh, mm -hmm. the other his other wife's houses, mm -hmm. um, the he, they they. Sallallahu. And then what did he say? I will never eat honey again. Okay, so it's the summary of the story. Gentlemen, you should all be embarrassed. You should all be embarrassed from this young boy. Make dua Allah makes him from the ulama. I mean, and the other young boy as well who also always answers the questions. I mean, Rabbil Al. So. The first thing is, uh, so this verse is revealed in a situation where the Prophet ﷺ, he had some honey with one of his wives and he stayed longer with her. And when he went to another one of his wives, they could smell the honey on him, right? right? And they made an issue about it. So he said, I will never have honey again. So Allah says to him, O Prophet of Allah, don't prohibit yourself. 
don't make forbidden honey which Allah made halal for you. See, the meaning, it's in a new light now because you know the situation in which the verse was revealed. Here's another one. Allah says in Surah Al-Hujurat, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَرْفَعُوا أَصْوَاتَكُمْ فَوْقَ صَوْتِ النَّبِي O oh, believers, don't raise your voice in front of the Prophet ﷺ. Tell me something. Do you think any Sahaba would scream at the Prophet ﷺ? So what is this verse about? You're going to let the other boy answer now? Is anyone going to help, us, help your situation, gentlemen? Yes. That was not quite the reason it was revealed The situation it was revealed But you're right There was somebody Who had a natural loud voice Who thought it was about him But that wasn't the situation This was revealed in Yes This is This, this is also One of the as by One of the reasons of revelation There were some new Muslims Outside the Prophet Sallallahu Private quarters And they were shouting at him uh, what the majority of the scholars of tafsir say is the reason this ayah was revealed was because Abu Bakr and Umar got in an argument in front of the Prophet Sallallahu and they started shouting at each other not at him at each other so Allah says don't raise your voice in front of him then he addresses the Bedouins who came outside his private quarters telling him to come outside to talk to them <laughs> don't scream don't call out to him like that those that are just calling you out saying, come out, talk to us. These are people of no etiquette. So, to understand the situation in which the verse was revealed, it helps you in contemplating the meaning of this verse. Okay? Part of this, part of this is also understanding the context within the surah. Right? The relationship between the verses. Here's an example. You have to give me the answer, all of you. Not these two boys, please. Yes? Give them a break. Okay. Allah says in the Quran, أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ Has not the time come for those who claim belief, those who are believers, that their hearts should soften when they hear the remembrance of Allah? Hasn't the time come? Then the next verse Allah says, اِعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يُحْيِي الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا Know that Allah revives the dead earth after it dies. What is the relationship between verse 1 and verse 2? They're one after the other, but what's the link? What does grass, the dead earth and plants coming out, what does this have to do with the heart and the Quran? Yes. Allah Akbar. Yes. So the link between these two verses. First, Allah says, Are your hearts so hard that when the Quran is recited, you feel nothing? The next verse, He says, Look, if I can revive the dead earth, the dead soil, I can bring plants out of it. I can revive your heart as well. There's the link between the verses. So don't just look at the context where was the verse revealed. Look at the verse after, the verse before. How are they linked? Think, ask questions. Yes? And interestingly, if you go back to books of tafsir, Ibn Kathir said exactly what this brother said here. And he's not read, he's not read the tafsir, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yes? Some say, some, uh, what, the first verse, yeah. The second one. Yes, some scholars say this is referring to Umar ibn Khattab as well, as far as I know. Okay, tool number three. So I said the first tool is knowing the big picture of the surah. The second tool is what? Knowing the context. Where was this verse revealed? What's before it? What's after it? Yeah? You all with me so far? Do we need to do some uh, stretches to keep you all awake? Inshallah. The third one is thinking about themes inside the Quran. Here's an example. I'm going to go to the Quran and I'm going to look for everywhere Allah said, Wallahu yuhib. Allah loves X. Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen Wallahu yuhibbul tawwabeen Allahu yuhibbul mutatahhireen I'm going to find every time Allah said He loves something I'm going to make a list I'm going to think about How do I earn the love of Allah? This is my bucket list My shopping list To earn the love of Allah This is another way to look at the Quran To think about the whole Quran as a message And to see patterns in it Another example Go to everywhere Allah said purification in the Quran Tuhur Tatahar 
and go and see what does this what does purification mean in the Quran. For example, go to every time Allah in the Quran says, "La tattabi'u khutuwat al-shaytan." Don't follow the footsteps of the shaytan. Gather all those verses and think about them together as a theme. For example, look at some amthal, some examples and analogies in the Quran, like the fly which we took earlier. What does those analogies mean? What's, it, what's the purpose? What's the action I can take away? These are some ways where you can look at the Quran as a whole and not just a single surah. Okay? These are three tools. Looking at an overview of the surah, looking at the context of the verses, and lastly, looking at themes across the Qur'an. These are three ways. And there are some translated tafsir works that can help you, some resources that can help you. As you all know, Tafsir ibn Kathir has been translated. Tafsir al-Qurtubi has been translated by Aisha Buley. Um, uh, tafsir al-Raji has been translated by Dr. Suhaib Saeed. And you have many other examples. One, of the, one actually work I recommend all of you to look at, Ustad Asim Khan. Ustad Asim Khan, has trans- he has a, an English commentary on Surah Yasin called The Heart of the Qur'an. And he has an English translation of a, his own written commentary on Suratul Mulk called The Kingdom of God. Suratul Mulk and Surah Yasin, Ustad Asim Khan. These uh, English explanations help you to access the deeper meanings in the text and make sure you don't go wrong in your, in your reflections. Okay. Now here's a starting point for you to act on today. Not tomorrow, not next week, today. Choose a surah. Either a short Makkan surah, like something in Juz'amma, Juz Tabarak, the last two sections of the Qur'an. Or choose a story-based surah, Surah Al-Kahf, Surah Yusuf, Surah Al-Qasas, Surah Al-Ankabut, Surah Al-Anbiya. Why? If you choose a surah that is full of rulings, like rulings of inheritance, Surah Nisa, Surah Maida, you'll spend a lot of time and you'll get nowhere because you cannot, you're not qualified to deduce the rulings from the Qur'an. So choose a story-based surah or a surah revealed in Mecca, you know, in, before Hijrah. Number one. Number two, in groups or as individuals, use these tools that I gave you today. You can choose one surah for all of Ramadan. Let's say Surah Al-Mulk, Surah Yasin. The whole of Ramadan, me and my group, we are the Surah Yasin Tadabbur crew. By the end of Ramadan, we're going to have a journal full of reflections on Surah Yasin. For example, I'm not saying Surah Yasin more than any other surah. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just giving an example. Pick a surah, find a group. And promise each other that you will gather once a week, once every two weeks, and together you will reflect on the meanings of the surah throughout Ramadan. Some important guidelines, I think I didn't have the slide, some important guidelines to know that your reflection of the Quran is valid. Ibn Qayyim rahimullah, he mentions, number one, your reflection, you know, if you're, if you're reflecting on the Quran and you share a reflection or you come to a conclusion, it should not change the original meaning of the verse. It, you should not go too far from the meaning of the verse in the translation or in the tafsir that you read. For example, if we're reflecting on that verse, Ya yuhan nabi lima tuharrimu ma ahallallahu lak. O Prophet of God, why do you make prohibited what Allah has made halal for? You cannot then conclude and say, you know what, all of us should never drink honey again. Don't take that out of your hat. Stay in your lane, right? So don't go far from the meaning of the verse. Number two, if you can, use resources. Videos, books, tafsir books, anything you can get your hands on to enhance and deepen your understanding of this surah. And for example, one of the best forms of tadabbur, if you want to see a real life example of great reflection on the Quran, there's a whole playlist called Fajr Reflections in Masjid al Furqan. This is a great example of real life reflections on the Quran. Right? Um, at number three, make sure that any reflection you bring, you're not in introducing a new meaning of the verse or changing the meanings in the Arabic language. You're not deducing a ruling, a fiqh ruling, a real life ruling. But you stick with the original meaning of the verse and you think, how do I apply this to my life? Some questions that you ask, you will not find the answer in your head. You cannot invent an answer, right? Oh, this ayah was after this ayah because of this. That might be your reflection, but you should go back to the books of tafsir and check, you know? فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ Ask someone of knowledge if you are unsure, if you don't know. And with this, inshallah, we'll come to the end. And I will give no time for questions, right? We'll come to the end. وَصَلَى اللَّهُ وَسَلَمُ بَارَكَ عَلَى نَبِيَنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِ أَجْمَعِينَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَك